Our next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Chris Oakley. Chris is one of, is a, um, does pediatrics training at the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters um, down in Norfolk, Virginia. And he um, <clears throat> then did his neurology training at Johns Hopkins. And uh, we're thrilled to have him uh, join us. He's one of the, one of the newer faces. Um, Cindy always has a new and fresh face, but Chris, is, uh, Chris really has not spoken at this conference before. So he is um, our resident headache expert. And one of the requests from the families was to talk a little bit about headaches. Um, the reason, so this is important to talk for two reasons. One, because headaches are a real problem. Two, because part of what Chris is going to talk about actually was um, impacted by something that was directly the result of an email that uh, Chris sent out, Chris Hall sent out, to the uh, medical advisory board asking about hydrocephalus after surgery. So I don't want to steal Chris's thunder, but this is um, a particular topic where you, the families, had an impact. So without further ado, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. So I appreciate y'all uh, having me here. Uh, this is my first time. Um, hopefully I will become an old face. No offense, Cindy. Um, but, uh, but, but in a few years. So yes, no, it, it, beautiful, beautiful. Um, so Adam also set me up with a task that will be extremely difficult for me. Uh, for those that know me, for me to speak about headaches in 20 minutes is going to be a challenge. Um, Sarah Kelly, who will be speaking in a little bit, says I'm up for the challenge, so we'll see if she's right. But uh, so we're going to go over sort of some, little, just a little bit about a background about headaches, um, some of the things that I see predominantly in my clinic. Um, some of the types of headaches, remember, primary headaches are, are very common. That's most of the time what's going to happen, even in, in, in your kids, after surgery and after epilepsy and with seizures, primary headaches are still going to be the vast majority of what you see. But we'll cover the secondary headaches as well, uh, as Adam mentioned. We'll go over some of the key things for you to look for, uh, some of the presenting symptoms, and some of the, the cues that, that might point you towards, is this something I need to be more concerned about than others? Uh, we'll briefly cover the evaluation just because it's more actually applicable in this patient population following surgery and with the history of epilepsy. And then we'll go over some treatment. Uh, I'm also staying for the panel discussion, so if there's questions that we get to or don't get to, we'll definitely get to that at the end um, or later this afternoon. So remember, headaches is the number one reason for referral to pediatric neurology. Epilepsy seizures is second, but headaches by far. Why? Because it's so common. Uh, so. What this is showing is uh, overall general headaches, headaches of any kind. By the time these kids get through middle school and high school, the vast majority have headaches of some sort. Migraines build again over time and uh, starts early. My youngest migraine patient's about a year and a half to two years of age. Um, so it really can be diagnosed early and you can pick up on these things and you can make a difference if you pick it up early. Keep in mind that tension headaches are the most common. Migraine is second most, and again, for pediatric neurology, the ones that come to see me in clinic, those are going to be the migraine kids, the chronic daily headaches. But the pediatricians, the primary care providers, they get a lot more of the tension headaches. And then impact of quality of life, uh, again, you, you all know that, that uh, neurological conditions have a huge impact on quality of life. This specifically looked at the quality of life in kids with just headaches. And there were three studies over the last decade looking at this out of some of the biggest headache groups in the country. Uh, and what they found was that these kids with headaches alone, not taking into consideration epilepsy or surgery or anything else, these kids had a quality of life similar to those with childhood cancer, diabetes, arthritis. So it's a big problem that, that can be addressed. And if we address it early and, and in the right fashion, we can actually make a difference in these kids. So remember, these are common problems. Headaches and migraines, tension headaches, they're common. Why? Most families have a history. I don't know how they only got 55%. I think they didn't ask. But if you ask your, your parents, your grandparents, siblings, somebody's got headaches. There's a family history out there. So again, especially if you have those in your family, it's even more common that the kids are going to have them as well. The younger kids, boys actually are a little bit ahead. And it's for headaches in general and for migraines. So slightly over 50%, 50, 55% in general, maybe up to 60% have migraines or boys in the younger ages. Once hormones kick in, puberty hits, girls take over. Uh, and they remain that way even through adulthood. Uh, and for those that are married in the room, you understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> Lifetime prevalence, uh, these numbers are low. These are actually for migraine. And it's estimated that one in three women have migraines sometime during their life. 
and a little over one in 10 men. Uh, we think these are low. We think that the problem is, is that these are underreported. The way we get these numbers is from those who show up to the neurologist. Uh, most people with headaches and migraines don't go to the neurologist. They might not even go to the doctor or their providers of any kind. And so these numbers are woefully low. Ethnicity does play a role. So um, this has been reported in Europe. Uh, again, when you do these studies in Norway and in Sweden, which is where the first two studies were done, 80, 85%, it's not surprising. When you repeat those studies in major metropolitan areas in the US and look at them over decades, these numbers still bear out. So it's not just where the studies were done, it really seems to be there is some link. Whether that's genetic, whether it's cultural, whether it's access to health care, we're not sure, but there is a link there. And when you look at epilepsy and headaches together, uh, they, they do go hand in hand. Um, migraine patients in general have about uh, two times as likely chance of developing epilepsy. Well, the overall prevalence of epilepsy is not that high, so doubling that, again, you're not talking about huge numbers. But when you look at pediatric epilepsy patients, they have an up to a five times as likely chance of developing migraines to the age equivalent counterparts. All right? So you'll hear from Dr. Kelly in a little bit, and Dr. Hartman, Dr. Kossoff, who many of you know, they looked at this about three years ago and found that about one in four of the epilepsy patients that they surveyed actually met criteria for migraine. It was more common in specific types of epilepsy, more common um, in the older kids, which would make sense as the older you get, the more likely you see this. Um, but in other studies, it was actually as high as 30 to 35 percent. So again, this is uh, compared to the, the age counterparts, they rate between three and about 20, 23 percent. So these numbers are a good bit higher. Again, headaches in general are more common as well. So it's not just migraine. It's tension headache. It's the nondescript headache. It's the ones you can't figure out. Why? There is a genetic link. And I'm not going to go into that, but there are multiple chromosomes, multiple genes that you cover that have that. I'm going to try to prove Adam wrong and beat my time, so I'm just checking that. With seizures. So whether it was pri pri prior to surgery, after surgery, uh, with seizures, you do see postictal headaches in about 40% with temporal lobe or frontal lobe epilepsy. And with occipital lobe, it's about 60%. So um, for those that, that seizures may still be uh, the, the occasional concern or the ongoing concern, it's not unusual to have a, a headache with, with your seizures. Um, and that may have been there before surgery, even if epilepsy has resolved or is, is, is sort of taking a step back and, and things are under better control, having headaches are still very common. Again, because overall, it's an overall big problem that we see, especially when seizures and epilepsy is present, even if it was in the past. This is a short list of a lot of the conditions that lead to both headaches, migraines, and epilepsy. And I'll put brain surgery down here again. Everybody that's here has had surgery, all right, and not a minor surgery but that does increase the chances of having these two conditions, even though the surgery was done because of the underlying epilepsy. Now, just keep in mind, there are over 200 different types of headaches. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Uh, that would take forever. I, I'm just gonna talk about the two categories that are important. Primary, which is again, by far the most common. That's what most of the kids have, whether they're, they're in my clinics, whether they're in the epilepsy clinics, or whether it's your kids that have headaches. Secondary headaches we'll cover briefly. Tension is most common. This is that everyday headache, that stress headache, that just sort of dull pressure ache, you know, had a bad day. All right, these are not the ones that generally make it to me. They don't even make it to the pediatrician or primary care docs usually. Migraine, second most common overall. Most common if you get referred to a specialist. Can be episodic or chronic, and then you see the numbers there. It actually causes uh, quite a bit of disability, just having migraines alone. Um, and actually, just for a comparison, pediatric migraine costs about $11 billion per year is what they estimate. Epilepsy is about $11.5 billion from a couple of years ago report. So it's, they're comparable in the cost overall, surprisingly. Probably because it's more prevalent, so you see so many more patients with it, even though the individual cost per patient is higher for epilepsy. Now, sort of the, the, the other headaches, the things you might see. Uh, Post-surgical, now this means in the very acute period afterwards. This is very different from the typical headaches that you may have before surgery or well after surgery, all right? It's usually around the surgical site, and that's not surprising. You know, anytime you have an incision, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna be sore. You treat these very differently. 
can be related to pressure changes, and that's a big concern in this population, right? Um, and it can be related to residual blood products or blood that got in there during the surgery, which again is, is very common. All right, and that's very irritating to the brain, so it's not surprising following surgery you're gonna have more headaches. Generally speaking, they do resolve in a few days to weeks, depending. Um, there are outliers that last longer, but that's the most part. And it really is, again, often around the surgical site. So you treat it like you would any other surgical pain. All right, so while we don't like things like narcotics and other sort of high dose pain medicines, following surgery, that's the exception. Now this is the, the study that Adam was talking about that, that actually Chris kind of helped develop and, and, and arrange and then um, actually the support group and foundation uh, helps kind of guide the study and look, look through it and uh, we got a lot of good information out of it. And this is from Epilepsy, uh, I believe 2012, I think. I don't have it up there on the date. But what it showed was is that about a quarter of the patients post-surgery developed hydrocephalus at some point. Now, it did, some, some of these patients, it took up to eight and a half years. About a quarter of them, it was in the first three months, first 90 days. And again, the significant risk factors for if you were to develop it was whether there was an anatomical resection versus a functional uh, resection. Uh, and then if there was a history of prior surgery. Again, the more surgery, the more times you go in, the more likely that, that something may happen. Interestingly, and I put this up here just because I think it's important for what we're talking about, what are the presenting symptoms for if you develop hydrocephalus? Headache, emesis, change in consciousness, behavior, cognitive changes. These are sort of the top five. This is also what you see typically in the primary headaches and the migraine patients. So it can be challenging to distinguish. Most of the time, migraine is gonna win out by far. Bottom line is, it is something that presents like hydrocephalus, so you have to watch for that. And there are some things I'll show you in a minute that can kind of help you tease it out as far as is this just a migraine? Is this a headache that I don't have to be as concerned about? Or do I need to worry that something's going on? All right. Typically, the actual pain of the headache, if the kids are able to say, hey, this is what it feels like, this is, this is where it's located, it's more like a tension headache, more of that global headache, more of a pressure, mild to moderate pain. Whereas the migraine, even though you may have emesis and some of these other symptoms, migraines are more intense, more severe, more pounding, throbbing type pain. Throwing up, vomiting, yep. So post-ictal headaches or ictal headaches. All right, now this could have been pre-surgery. It could be post-surgery, it all depends. And it's, again, related to a headache caused by an epileptic seizure occurring during or after the seizure and remitting within hours to days. That's pretty vague, but that's the best that the headache society could do is coming up with what do you, how do you classify an ictal headache? Most of the time, it's with a partial seizure, all right? And the headache is on the same side as where the seizure discharges are coming from. So if, if the seizure is focused over here, that's where the headache is going to be, even though you may see clinical symptoms on the opposite side, all right? Um, how do you treat this? You treat it like, like you would a seizure. Even if the seizure is brief, a few seconds, you treat this with the same seizure drugs you would normally. So your first line acutely is, is some of the, the benzos, some of the things like um, Ativan or something like that. Uh, and then how do you prevent this? You actually treat it with seizure drugs, all right? Um, often the partial drugs like trileptal or Tegretol. Now, you come in to see us and we have headaches and, and that's your complaint and sort of that's the thing that you're worried about. What are we gonna do? We're gonna get a history. All right, we're gonna look for red flags and we're gonna do an exam, all right? You're not gonna take a history like we would in the ER or, or for the neurologist or the primary care, but you can look for the red flags. So believe it or not, if you're over three, it's not a red flag. Remember, my youngest headache patient, migraine patient, is about a year and a half. Uh, and, and there's a lot of younger kids with headaches and they, they make it in more and more now because pediatricians and primary care providers are realizing this is a problem even in the younger population and it only grows as you get older. Early morning headaches, and this is one of the things that can help you decide is there some sort of a pressure buildup. Maybe there is hydrocephalus. This is the kids that, it's not when they're getting ready to go to the school bus, it's not when you're in the car driving to school, it's they open their eyes and before they get out of bed, they feel miserable on an ongoing basis. They're waking up at two, three in the morning with their headaches. That's the concerning feature, all right? A one-time a one occurrence of that, that's not that big, that's not that much of a concern to me. If it's happening every single day and every single night, we at least need to be aware of it and that's something we're gonna look for. 
That also goes for early morning nausea, early morning vomiting. Those are the things to be looking for. There's a sudden onset of severe headache or a rapid progression, that's another concern. The sort of chronic just ebbs and flows of headaches, that's what we don't worry about. And if there's any big mood changes, we worry about that as well. Now, what should the moms and the dads, because there's a lot of dads in the room too, what should the moms and the dads look for? What should the parents look for? Well, the red flags we just talked about, all right? Changes in headaches. Remember, if the kids had headaches before surgery, they're probably gonna have them after surgery. If they're similar to what they were before, generally speaking, they're probably in the primary headache category. And we look for big changes. If you're seeing any of those red flags, be concerned. Call your doc, call your, you know, your neurologist or your, your, your primary care, get them checked out. But if it's not a change in headache, we don't want to, we, we don't want to overreact and, 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 and do more than we need to. The physical cues. So a lot of the kids that I see are young or have other neurological concerns where maybe they can't communicate quite as well. But the parents will come in and say, you know, their face turns red on one side, their ear or uh, gets red. They look like their eyes are swollen or the one eye is swollen. There's pupillary changes. Those are normal things that we see with migraines and a lot of the primary headaches. So that's not a major concern in the grand scheme of things, the big picture. All right. But as an isolated thing, it is something for you to be aware of, look for, and it does help us even if the kids aren't able to communicate with us and tell us exactly what's going on. Big mood changes, big personality changes. You got a headache or a migraine, you're going to be a little irritable, you're going to be a little quiet, a little reserved. But if it's an ongoing concern, if it's an ongoing change, that's when we get worried. And then these are specifically what you see with migraine, light and sound sensitivity, nausea, vomiting, those are things to look for as well given how common this is in, in the population. A lot of the younger kids that I see and some of the kids with intellectual disability or autism, um, they can't really communicate a lot, so I get parents that will bring them in and say, I think they're having headaches. Why? Because they're hitting their heads. They're head banging. Now, you gotta get the bigger picture. You gotta get the bigger story. If that's an isolated event and they seem uncomfortable, it seems to come on suddenly, uh, it's short-lived, it very well may be pain, but it also can be something that they're doing as a self-stimulation or out of frustration, out of anger if they can't get their point across or can't communicate. So you gotta look at the whole picture, but it is something to keep an eye on and track. What else should parents look for? Again, positional nature. That's why the early morning overnight headaches are concerning. You're lying flat, pressure builds up. You stand up, generally gravity helps you, things get better. That's a concern, maybe there is pressure or hydrocephalus. Is there any seizure activity related around the headache? Could it be one of the seizure related headaches? Where's the pain? Is it right at the surgical site? Is it where the scar is? Maybe there's some scar tissue, maybe there's a nerve that's gotten pinched or pulled and it's more of a neuralgia. And then mom's gut's never wrong. If mom's worried that there's a change, dad's gut's too, but moms do, do, do this more. Uh, if, if they have that concern and they're worried about something, chances are that, that there's something worth addressing and it should be brought to somebody's attention. Now, from a workup, labs, bottom line, we don't do a whole lot. All right, EEG. If you think there's active seizures going on, then we get an EEG, but otherwise we would not routinely recommend just getting an EEG because there's a spike in headaches or a change in headaches. All right? Neuroimaging is the big one. All right? Should every one, of the, uh, every one of the kids that comes in with a headache get an automatic head CT and an MRI? Now, granted, I understand that this is a, a very special isolated patient population that has, has had special circumstances with major uh, you know, brain surgery and hemispherectomy, but it's looking at the bigger picture. If they had migraines before, this is a typical migraine, their exam looks stable, they look good, you don't automatically have to get imaging. All right? Now, in the ER, in the urgent care settings, I'm going to have a hard time selling that, and I understand that. But the point is, is that, that we do want to take a bigger look at the whole picture and not just knee-jerk reaction, get a picture every time there's a headache. We want to look at the whole picture and see what we can do and treat it accordingly. How do you treat it? Combination works best. So this is how I treat my, my headache and migraine patients. It's how I would treat all headache and migraine patients. And again, whether it's migraine or headache in general, it's a pretty similar combination treatment. So it doesn't matter as much whether we tease out what type of headache it is. NSAIDs and fluids are the base treatment. Now the studies say at younger ages, usually under puberty, the Tylenol works about as well. But Motrin's, naproxen, 
That's normally our first line. What do fluids mean? Especially if you think it's a migraine, caffeine gets added in. So a Coke, a glass of tea, a cup of coffee if you're older, or even if you're younger and the kids will drink it, that helps. Antiemetics. So anti-nausea, anti-vomiting medicines. Even if they're not having nausea or vomiting, these can be helpful for a migraine. Right? Now for my home choice, I use Zofran. It's pretty benign, it's, it's safe, it's got a, you know, younger kids take it, pregnant women take it, so generally speaking, it's, it's a pretty good track record. There are some stronger nausea vomiting meds that help. I usually use those in an acute setting, like in an ER urgent care, and then home if need be. Triptans. So this is the things like Imitrex, Maxalt, Relpax. You may have heard some of those names. Those are the migraine medicines. If the kids have migraines, regardless of what their past history is, unless they've got major cardiac problems, we can use triptans, and they work well, especially in combination with the Motrin and fluids. And then antihistamines. We often will add Benadryl in. It actually does help with headaches. It helps with the nausea. It makes the kids sleepy. Now, it does alter their consciousness. It makes them drowsy. It might make their mental status change. So that's a, up to the parents if they're comfortable doing that or not. And that's something that, again, talking with your neurologist, your neurosurgeon, how comfortable are they with that, because you don't want to mask symptoms. The bottom line is these drugs aren't going to treat hydrocephalus. These drugs aren't going to treat a seizure headache. So if the medicines work, you're more reassured. If it's not working, so Adam proved me right. <laughs> or I proved him right. I don't know which one. Either way, but I will finish up quickly. For daily prevention, daily uh, things, we do a combination. Lifestyle is key, like everything else. Sleep, hydration, diet, exercise, the base. Addressing stress and anxiety is important as well. We do a lot of complementary therapies, a lot of behavioral therapy. Um, vitamins and supplements are out there. They do work. Uh, we have a list of five or six that are good for migraines and headaches. Medicines. It's okay to use daily prevention meds. It's okay to go back on the seizure meds. Why? Because that's, again, based on this, when should you go back? How bad are the headaches? How much are they affecting you? You're in the red? Use it. The yellow? Can think about it. You're in the green? You don't need to be on daily med. But if you do, there's some good ones out there for kids. The one with the best studies? or Elevil and Topamax. So if there's anxiety, mood problems, use Elevil. If there's not, Topamax. In fact, Topamax's webpage doesn't even talk about seizures anymore. It's all advertised for migraine. All right. The younger kids, we use Periactin, which is a Benadryl-like medicine. And then, oh, by the way, there's all of these. And that's a partial list, but it's ones you may have seen before. These are the anti-epileptics, uh, the antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds that we use in kids' headaches. And I use all of these. All right, just to note these two, trileptal tegretol, that's for the nerve pain headaches, not for migraines, not for tension headaches. But again, it's okay if you have to go back on these meds. It doesn't mean that surgery didn't work. It doesn't mean that the, the seizures are coming back. It means you have headaches, which is common, even more so in this population, and so we treat them. That's my mentor who passed away, who taught me everything. It's actually who wrote the guidelines that we follow um, so that's kind of why I'm doing this and why I'm up here.